I, I, I don't understand how Protestants can interpret the Bible. How do they have the authority to interpret the Bible? Yeah, I'm glad you asked that, man. It's a great question. My answer would be because if you read through the Bible itself, there's no authority given to someone to be the interpreter of the Bible. Instead, we are given the scriptures and therefore God speaks in a way that's clear that anyone can then read it, understand the main message, particularly the way of salvation. So when Jesus himself, he quotes the scriptures in, say, Matthew 21, 42, Jesus says, have you never read in the scriptures? And then he quotes, the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. This is the Lord's doing and it's marvelous in our eyes. He's quoting from the book of Psalms here. But he says, have you never read in the scriptures? Which implies that we can read this and understand it and interpret it for ourselves. We don't need some sort of external interpreter to tell us what it means. Um, also, when Paul sends his letters to the churches, say if we go to Colossians 4, verse 16, he says, when this letter has been read among you, have it also read in the church of the Laodiceans and see that you also read the letter from Laodicea. So he doesn't say, you got to have it read and then you got to have someone go interpret it because it's too convoluted for anyone to understand for themselves. No, you just read it out. And then you also read the letter from the Laodiceans, which is what we scholars recognize. That's the book of Ephesians. It's the letter from Laodicea because they're right next to each other. Um, so just nothing in how the Bible presents scripture does it indicate that you need some sort of external authoritative interpreter. You can just go in and understand it for yourself. Um, even maybe when... Timothy, Paul's talking to Timothy. He says, how from childhood you have been acquainted with the sacred writings. Like even as a child, you've been acquainted with the sacred writings, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. There's no indication of needing some sort of external interpreter to tell you what it means. Uh, yeah, but uh, the problem is, like I already said, uh, there's a lot of these Protestant denominations and they each have separate interpretations. There's like a word. There's just like 35,000 different interpretations. Or like each one of them interprets it different. So if the scripture was as clear as it says there, uh, why are all the, why is there all these denominations and separations? Just like there's so many separations within the Roman Catholic Church. There's different beliefs, different traditions, different things that there, there's where you got this quote from what 35,000 different denominations. Oh, I just got same. It. <laughs> okay, okay, yeah, but that that comes from an encyclopedia, which also says there's about two hundred different denominations within the Catholic Church itself. Now, do you come from a Catholic Church background? Uh, no, not really. Uh, I said I was raised religious. Uh, I wasn't raised okay. anything. <laughs> sure, sure, sure. Okay. The reason why there can be different interpretations is because people can read a text with their own bias and maybe what we call eisegete it rather than exegete it. Now, eise means into, exo means out of. So sometimes people can read a passage and try and put into the passage what they want it to say when we shouldn't do that. We shouldn't do eisegesis. We should do exegesis, which is basically getting out from the passage what it's really just saying. And sometimes, though, people will put their own ideas into it or only choose, like maybe that last gentleman, to pick, okay, I want to pick this verse, but I don't want to be consistent with all the rest of the passages. I think we've got to interpret Scripture with Scripture. Scripture is the best interpreter for itself. So if we come up with an interpretation that's just like way out there, that's opposite to all the rest of the Bible, probably our interpretation of that verse is wrong. You know what I mean? Yeah, I understand. Now, that. now the issue with having an external interpreter, say having like a pope, or the Catholic Church telling you what it means. Guess what? The Catholic Church has only infallibly interpreted seven verses of the Bible. Infallibly. Only seven out of the tens of thousands, I think maybe even hundreds of thousands of verses that are in the Bible, they've interpreted seven. That's all. And so then if the Catholic Church is supposed to be the infallible interpreter... They haven't done their job if they've only interpreted seven verses infallibly. You see? Yeah. Uh -oh. And and so that's why... Plus, you also got a problem of if you have to have an interpreter to interpret the Bible, 
how do you know you're interpreting your interpreter correctly? Yeah, that's, that's very true. Right. So that's the thing is that you still have to interpret any words that you read or hear. You have to interpret them. Do you think a Pope is going to be clearer than God's own inspired word? I mean, from what I understand, oh, like you said uh, prior that uh, there's only like uh, the, the Catholic Church has only said a, a few infallible things, right? Not everything right. the Pope says is, inf is infallible. It has to have like certain pre uh, pre circums like prerequisites is there to, to, to yeah, for, what a, <clears throat> for what it's... Yeah, for what ex cathedra and so on. Yeah. Yeah, but what I'm trying to say is that who's going to be clearer? Um, statements that have been made by a Pope ex cathedra or from church councils and their interpretation of maybe seven of these verses that they have interpreted. Do you think that's going to be clearer than God's own inspired word? I have to really think about it. Well, think of it. Who's going to speak clearer, man or God? But uh, you, like yourself as a person, how do you know you're going to interpret, interpret it correctly, right? The same way that I just got to interpret your sentence correctly. Because words have meanings, right? How, can, how do you know you're going to interpret those church councils correctly? Do you realize there is a whole, amongst theologians, even within the Roman Catholic Church, there's a whole lot of debate on how to interpret the early um, the, 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 the decisions of some of the church councils. Some interpret it this way, some interpret it that way. There's even yeah, I mean, that's, the, that's that. a reason for the schism, right? Yeah, yeah, that's true. And, but even after the schism, there's still debate over how they yeah. interpret the Council of Trent, how they interpret the Council of Florence, how they interpret Vatican I, Vatican II. There's dispute there even amongst Catholic theologians on how they interpret the Catholic Church Council decisions. So rather than saying, I have to interpret an interpreter of an interpreter of an interpreter, let's just go back to God's own word. Let's go back to Scripture. Ha go back to Scripture, exactly. And Scripture is clear. It's not an ambiguous book. I think a child could even just read the Bible and get the main message of salvation very clearly from that. Sure, there's some a lot of deep stuff in the Bible too, and that's why you can spend a whole lifetime studying the Bible and you learn more stuff every time. But just in terms of the main things, like even being wise for salvation, as this passage says, you can find that both in the Old and New Testaments very clearly if you just read it. So like out of all the denominations, who do you think is like, the most like who who follows i guess you say scripture the most who, who... i don't think it's about saying like, this denomination's better yeah i don't think it's about saying this is the best denomination out of all the others i think it's a matter of there is just one church and god works beyond denominational boundaries there can be saved people in the roman catholic church in the orthodox church in the baptist church in the protestant the non-denominational church there can be christians in all different churches as long as that person is trusting in Christ alone to save them, not their works, not sacraments. And they make sure that, yeah, they aren't departing onto a false gospel. I think that's really important. And I think Christians can have some false beliefs about secondary issues. Like it's possible for someone to still be saved, but unfortunately they do this practice of praying to Mary. Now, I, can I think they can still be saved, even if they're doing that practice of praying to Mary, because their faith is in Jesus to save them and not in good works or sacraments. You know what I mean? I mean, well, I'm, I'm not really well versed in Roman Catholicism because I kind of just did an overview of like church, church history. So I don't think sure. I'm a part of any denomination at this point. <laughs> so okay. from what I've heard yeah. from like that, from the you, I was going to say, you don't have to, you don't have to identify as any denomination. I don't actually label myself by any denomination. I just call myself a Christian because it's the very thing that the apostles did. They just labeled themselves as believers, as Christians. So in Acts chapter 11, verse 26, it says here, In Antioch, the disciples were first called Christians. That's what they called themselves, just Christians. They didn't label themselves as sub-branches. In fact, in some ways, Paul rebukes people for doing, making all these different branches, in uh, making divisions in the church. So in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 12, uh, I'll go verse 11. It says, For it has been reported to me by Chloe's people, but there is quarreling among you, my brothers. What I mean is that each one of you says, I follow Paul, or I follow Apollos, or I follow Cephas, or I follow Christ. Is Christ divided? 
Was Paul crucified for you? Were you baptized in the name of Paul? And so you see some people saying, look, I'm going to follow Luther. I'm going to follow this person. I'm going to follow the Pope. I'm going to follow... Let's just follow Jesus. Let's just follow him and check to make sure that what we're believing lines up with Scripture, and that way you don't go astray. Uh, th thank you very much, man. You you answered the questions I asked. <laughs> now I want to ask you, though, um, do you think you'll go to heaven then, Oscar? Uh, uh, yeah. I mean, if you're in a state of yeah. grace and uh, you put your faith in Jesus, yeah. Uh, heaven is guaranteed. Okay. When you say if you're in a state of grace, how do you get into a state of grace? Uh, by having faith in Jesus Christ. Yeah. So do you have to get baptized? Oh, I, I'm not. Uh, I, I've only like recently gotten into all this, like a month. So I'm not really that scrupulous. So I can't, I can't really tell. <laughs> no, no, I'm just asking what your beliefs are. I'm just curious what your beliefs are. Do you think someone needs to get baptized to be in the state of grace? Mm, I'm not quite sure, actually. Okay. Yeah. Um, well, you said you had a moment ago, you said you had to have faith in Jesus. Do you think that's sufficient in of itself to get you into heaven? I mean, wouldn't baptism be like more like uh, like an addition? So like you'd have to have right. like, so baptism would be an addition plus your faith to like, I guess, further strengthen like your bond. So it, right. So faith as, you know, trusting in what Jesus did to save you. Baptism then being a good work that we get to do for God as a way of declaring our faith to the world. So then, I guess, would you say that it is by faith and our good works that we get right before God? Uh, no, I, I think, well, uh, good works are a part of faith. It's not works that save you because you could do all these good works, you could donate, but they're not going to save you if you don't have faith in Christ. So I think by having faith in Christ, you do good works. So, so are you saying to me that, Right, right. So they're not part of salvation. So you're saying that the works are simply a result of having faith? Yes. Yeah, good. So then, since baptism is a good work that we do for God, then would you have to get baptized to go to heaven? I mean, uh, that's a difficult question. I can't well, really. You just an said answer. you did. I mean, do our good I works play like any part? Do our good works get? Any, do they play any part in getting us to heaven? Uh, no, but uh. Uh, they, they, I say they further solidify your belief in Christ and they, they help you. Yeah, well, I think that they are uh, ways in which we say thank you to Jesus for his amazing sacrifice. But if you agree that they don't play any part in getting you to heaven, and since baptism is a good work we do for Jesus, therefore, that should answer the question then of, do you have to get baptized to go to heaven? Uh, then probably not. It's just, uh, no. it right. just solidifies the bond with you and Christ. Yeah, so I mean, it doesn't even wash good, things away. Exactly. Yeah, you got it, man. Good job. Because if God was to judge you based on how you've lived, would you say you deserve heaven or hell? Uh, I mean, I'm quite undecided yet because, you know, I, I didn't really have a religion yeah. to begin with. Yeah? I mean, at the moment, I'd say probably heaven because I have spent uh, time like uh, reading all of this and I've recently gotten into like reading like church history and then I, I for my Bible, I recently just got it, so I've only read uh, the ser the Sermon on the Mount. Like I, I've read certain parts of the New Testament and Old Testament. So yeah, I'd say probably, I would yeah. say this: reading church history is nowhere near on the um, on the importance level of as reading the Bible. So I would say, pause any sort of reading of church history. Let your focus be on reading God's precious Word, right? Because when people try and say to you. How can you really interpret the Bible for yourself? They're really saying, don't read the Bible because you can't interpret it. Listen to me instead. Do you see a problem with that? Uh, yeah, it's uh, putting man over God. Right. It's a thing that Satan did back in the Garden of Eden. God said to Adam and Eve, don't eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And then Satan comes along and says, did God really say this? And so notice that he's questioning, look, maybe you misinterpreted God, maybe this, maybe God, right? And so they're saying, he's basically saying, listen to me rather than listening to God. That's what Satan was doing. And that's exactly what the Catholic and Orthodox Church are doing when they say, you can't interpret the Bible for yourself. Listen to us instead. Well, that's a big danger sign, isn't it, right? <laughs> so... 
you said you you probably would go to heaven because you've been trying to get closer to God or you've been trying to do stuff for God recently. But let me ask you, how many lies do you think you've told in your life? A lot. I mean, me too. I don't, I've think, I've count, I don't think I have a count of it. Yeah, lost count. Yeah. Um, have you ever used bad language? Oh yeah, definitely. Yep. Or, or even this one. Have you ever been angry or rude to someone? Oh yeah, to a lot of people. Yeah. I've done the same things. And so if God was to judge you based on these things and and plus anything else you've done wrong, do you think you'd be innocent or guilty? I mean, I, I'd be guilty, wouldn't I? Me too. Yeah. We'd definitely be guilty for breaking God's law. So should we get rewarded or punished? Uh, punished. Right. And does that punishment sound like heaven or hell? Hell. Yeah. Which is not where we want to go to because it is a lake of fire and it goes on forever. So what do you think you could do at this point so you don't have to go to hell? Uh, re repentance. Okay, what do you mean by repentance? Uh, asking Christ to forgive you for, for the sins you've committed. Huh? Okay, imagine if in a court of law, criminals found guilty, said to the judge, Judge, I'm so sorry for the crimes I've done. Please just forgive me and let me go free. Do you think the judge would just let the criminal go free? Oh, absolutely not. No, you're right, because... Saying sorry and even stopping the bad things doesn't fix the crimes. So in the same thing with us and God, we can say sorry to God for all the sins we've done, but we've still got to get punished for them, which would still be hell. Does that make sense? Yes. The so prayers and life improvement and like following the the uh, the right way of living isn't going to get you to heaven. What we need is we need someone who would be kind enough to take our punishment on our behalf. It's Christ. That was Christ. Good job. So if Jesus takes 100% of your punishment, how much punishment is left for you? None. So then if you don't have to go to hell and hell anymore, where do you get to go to? Heaven. Well done. Yeah. So then why do you get to go to heaven? Because Christ uh, died and redeemed those other sins. Yeah, absolutely. So notice it's actually nothing about us. It's not the fact that you've started getting more into God recently and you've got baptized or you're doing good things. It's just... Jesus died for me. I should be in hell. He took it for me. You just have to trust that, that that's the only reason you're going to heaven, which is why it makes it crazy when people think, oh, you got to get baptized. You're like, where's that in the, it's just Jesus died for a sinner like me. That's why I'm going to heaven. So what would happen? Let me ask you, if today you trust in Jesus, he died for you. Tomorrow you choose to sin again in some way and you die doing that sin. Would you go to heaven or hell? heaven no because uh, christ still took the still took our sins. yeah man good job you got it right what if you don't trust that he died for your sin where do you end up the hell because you have to put your yeah. whole trust in him correct so then when would it be good to start trusting that 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 his death on the cross is the reason why you'll go to heaven your whole life yeah even for yourself like from this point on right so don't think to yourself, because I'm getting more religious and sinning less, I'm going to heaven. Get rid of that idea. It should just be, Jesus died for a horrible sinner like me. That's why I'm going to heaven. That's an amazing message, isn't it? Absolutely. So if you stood before God today and he asked you, why should I let you into heaven? What would you say to him? Because uh, uh, of your only begotten son, sacri sacrificing himself to take the sin of humanity. Yeah, well done, man. So then, does doing good things have any part in getting you into heaven? No, probably not. It, but it like it's. I mean, it may help some people convert. You know, just saying like. Oh sure, we should do good things. God calls us to do good things now, absolutely. But just not not for heaven, right? So like, if I gave you an amazing gift, let's say I gave you a million dollars as a gift. You'd be like, whoa, that's so, thank you so much. You'd be like, can I do anything for you, right? I can wash your car, whatever it is. Not because you had to, but just because you were thankful. And so because we know what Jesus has done, he's given us something far better than even a million dollars, eternal life. It makes us say, well, Jesus, what, what can I do for you? And Jesus says, well, let's avoid sin now. Let's try and, you know, I want you to avoid sin. I want you to now walk in holiness and do the things I want you to do. So we do them not because we have to then to go to heaven, but because we've already got the gift of heaven. Yeah, I mean, that's what I said. It's uh, works are a part of faith. It's not that works not are going to save you, but like you're, you're like uh, because of your faith in Christ, you'll do works. 
Yeah, so make sure you don't say works are a part of faith. That's that wouldn't be correct because oh. then you're because you, you're not distinguishing them. Then you're saying that oh, works, works are like a result of faith. That'd yes, that's the better one. Yeah, works are a result of faith. Exactly. Good job. So, out of a hundred, how sure are you right now that you'll go to heaven? Oh, a hundred. Right. And is it possible for you to lose your state of grace if you're still trusting Jesus died for your sin? Oh no, I thought I, no. no. Exactly. You're secure, right? He gives you the Holy Spirit even as the guarantee of your inheritance, which is awesome. Okay, so then um, if a, a friend says to you he's going to heaven because he's a good person, where would he go, heaven or hell? Well, it depends if he had faith in Christ. Well, based on what he said, he said he's going to heaven because he's a good person. So is he trusting in Jesus to go to heaven or himself? Oh, himself. Yeah, so where does he end up? At hell. Yeah, because if we trust in what we do... Sort of like spiritual pride, you could see it as... Right, yeah. Because when I asked you before about if if God judged you based on how you've lived, would you go to heaven or hell? You thought heaven, because in essence you were thinking about your actions. You see that? Yeah. So if we trust in what we do to go to heaven, we end up in hell. If we trust in what Jesus did to save us, we do go to heaven. But what if someone was to trust in both? Jesus and their own actions to go to heaven. So let's say their baptism and good deeds. Let's say they trust in both to get to heaven. Would they go to heaven or hell? Wouldn't they go to heaven? Because at the end of the day, they still trust in Christ. But are they trusting 100% in Jesus to get them to heaven or only 50%? Wouldn't it be possible for them to trust fully in both? Or, or they can... No. Because you can only, you've only got 100% total. Right, so if you got 100% total, well, then you could put either 100% in Jesus and 0% in anything else. Or if you want to split up your trust, you could put 50% in Jesus and 50% in yourself. But it's impossible to 100% in Jesus and 100% in something else because you don't have 200% to use. You've only got 100% in total. Do you see that? Yeah, I see it. I see your point. It's maybe like this. If I told you that you... Actually, if you told me that I was that you were going to buy me a ticket to a concert on the weekend, but I wasn't really sure if you were. So I kind of just made sure I bought my own ticket just in case you didn't give me the ticket. Was I really trusting you then? Were you? Well, you said you're going to buy me a ticket. I went and bought my own ticket just as a backup, just in case I needed it. Oh, no. Was I trusting you? Exactly. No. So I was putting 50, so my entry into the concert was putting 50% the ticket you're going to buy for me and 50% the ticket I bought for myself. That's not trusting you. And that's the same thing. If someone's like, yeah, Jesus died for me, but I think I've also got to do extra things. I've got to cooperate with his grace. Otherwise I lose it and don't gain it. Then we're not trusting Jesus. So where does that person end up? Hell. Yeah, exactly. We're almost trying to rob God of the glory. By saying, hey, look, I did something to get myself in. Jesus did a, bo a bunch of it, but I did some as well. We're robbing him of the full glory then. All right? So think back at the beginning of this conversation. What did you think was going to get you into heaven? I mean, uh, it's always the faith, of faith in Christ first, right? Yeah, but for yourself, when I asked you earlier about, you know, if God judged you based on how you've lived, where do you think you'd go? You pointed to your actions as the reason why you thought you'd go to heaven, right? Do you remember that? So do you see how you're trusting in yourself? Yeah. So then if you had died before this chat began today, where would you have ended up? Uh huh. Right. But if you died this very moment, where would you go? Heaven. Right. Praise the Lord. Right. It's an amazing thing that he would die for wretches like us who don't even deserve an opportunity to be saved. He sends his son to die for us. Does this make you love Jesus so much? Of course, man. He took uh, yeah. the original sin from Adam and Eve. He took his, because humanity was like, we were stained with sin since the beginning, you know? And yeah. he took all of that sin for us. Yeah, and not even just original sin, but even all of our personal sins we've done too. All of it on the cross, even the future ones. And so then, what would, because you love Jesus, what does it make you want to try and not do anymore? I guess uh, avoid uh, I guess, faith in myself, sort of. Yeah, good, good answer. And what else? Anything else that Jesus wouldn't want you to do? 
I can't really think of anything at the moment. Maybe about sin. Sin. Oh, of course. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's like, that's fine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So so basically, we, we try and avoid sin, not because we think we need to to go to heaven, but just because we love Jesus. We're grateful to him. We're like, Jesus, I'm willing to do anything for you. So rather than the grace of God giving you an excuse to sin, it actually gives you the motivation not to. You see that? Yeah, I see. Yeah, that's awesome. So you got your Bible now, which I'm glad you do. Yeah. Start reading it every day. Okay. And you can understand it. Um, what what kind of Bible did you get? Was it in modern English or was it old English? Oh, I got a King, the classical King James. Yes, yeah, it's, it's sort of like okay. hard, a bit hard. Yeah. That's hard, and that's why like NIV and like that are easy. Yeah. To, so yeah, you should get one that's in modern English because that's why you're yeah, like, how can I interpret it? It's got like all the and thou and all this stuff stuff I don't understand. Yeah, if you get one and it's in modern English, you're gonna find it a heap easier to understand. So that's why I'd recommend you do that. And start in John's Gospel, maybe one of the Gospels as you're doing, and just go through the entire New Testament. It gives you a solid foundation on the Christian faith. And whenever you're hearing stuff from people saying, you've got to get baptized to be saved, or you've got to do this and do sacraments to be saved, just go back to heaven is a gift. If something is a gift, would you have to work for it? No, not really. No. So if anyone's telling you that you have to do the, these good works, of circumcision, I mean, or baptism or sacraments, then you can know that's not a gift anymore if those were requirements for me to go to heaven or, or keep salvation. Yeah. Does all that all right. help, man? Yeah, thanks, man. Yeah, that's awesome. Any other questions you want to ask? Oh, yeah. no, not really. <laughs> that's about it. Awesome. Hey, man, thanks for sticking around. And, um, yeah, feel free to... Uh, I'd love to see how you're going in your journey with, with the Lord as time goes on, man. Thanks, man. Cool. No worries. See you, man.